Good morning, everybody. Good morning. See the choir coming on in, too. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. Elise Berry, and I have the pleasure of filling in some big shoes for Reverend um, Brooke Baker here. I am... Uh, wanted to start, before we get really started into the, the liturgy for today, um, to do a little grounding session. Um, I'm highly aware that I'm a guest in your house, <laughs> and I'm also just very aware that folks might be coming in with very heavy hearts and souls, given what's going on in the world, um, particularly in Israel and Palestine. Uh, I know it's been very heavy on me. There's also earthquakes happening in Afghanistan. There's a crisis continuing at the border. There's just so much going on. And um, I, those who know me well will know I'm a person that rarely is left speechless. I have a lot of words <laughs> about a lot of things. I have poems. I have uh, a lot to say. But right now what I feel like I've been drawn to is um, stillness, restorativeness, and kind of the vibration that connects us all together. Uh, there's been a lot of images, a lot of words that you've received probably over this week, personally, professionally, globally, all of these things. So in, honor to, in, in order to honor all of that, I'm going to invite us into a little sound meditation, if that sounds good to you. Um, if it doesn't, uh, sorry, <laughs> it'll only be a couple of minutes. <laughs> Um, but what we're going to do is uh, uh, start with, and uh, also just to say that, you know, vibration is not only found where everywhere there's life, it's found everywhere there's a thing. So it's sound waves, it's a planet that has no life, vibrates. This bowl that's not alive vibrates. The voice from Sinai, uh, our voice of our God, vibrates forever. And we are all part of that. And what we have here and the sound that we can offer up as a prayer and just the vibration that we share uh, reverberates throughout the world. And so I offer us to respond to where we are with a, a, a vibration of love and care and connection that we can hold here in this space that travels well beyond these walls. So we're going to start with uh, our voice, and if um, I feel it's good to you, I'm going to play, this is called a shruti box, which is a drone instrument, and I'm going to invite us to hum. You can hum in tune with this. Uh, if it's out of tune, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if it's in tune, great. If you want to do a harmony, also great. Uh, you can do it at your own pace, I'll just, whenever you take a deep breath in, and hum. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And just keep doing that. It doesn't need to be in sync with everyone. We'll just create some vibrations there. And then what I'll do is I'll gradually uh, transition us to the bowls, where I invite you just to notice your breath and just kind of get some stillness. And then I'll gradually transition us to the drum uh, to focus on your heartbeat and play the heartbeat sound. The first sound we all heard in our mother's womb, in our parents' womb, uh, was her heartbeat. And that's the heartbeat of the universe as well. And then I'll finally invite us into a moment of stillness and silence uh, as well. So if you join me, take a deep breath in and out at your own pace. I invite you to hum also at your own pace, maybe even noticing the vibration in your lips and in this room.
So it's the stillness after this movement, the silence after the sound, that we are all part of the eternal echo, and we offer our voices, our cries, our laughter what is spoken and unspoken up to God, knowing that it is the exact right prayer, just enough, just right for this moment. Remembering that we are held by that great voice and arms, let us say amen. Amen. Welcome to worship. morning. Please rise in body or spirit for our call to worship. Accessible, inclusive, multi-sensory God, in celebration of you and your creation today, we give thanks for all. We give thanks for people of all experiences, disabilities, and abilities. God, you invite us to learn more, to connect more, to offer helpful accommodations so people of all abilities and disabilities, minds and bodies, can thrive. God, all minds and bodies echo your reflection. God, you are accessible to all, opening our awareness to you on this day in which we remember accessibility and disability awareness. Together, may your creation be joyful and reflective. There is work to celebrate and work to continue in making your world fully accessible. Amen. Please join in singing hymn number 31, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
as we join in our prayer of invocation. God of all our senses and all abilities and disabilities, we come before you preparing our bodies, hearts, and minds for worship. Whether having a singular or multiple focus, whether comfortable, uncomfortable, or somewhere in between, feeling included, excluded, or somewhere in between. We are celebrating the ways that our minds and bodies experience the world and reflect and echo your love, truth, and grace. God, we thank you for diversity in abilities, which we celebrate today. Amen. Let us pass the peace in whatever way you feel most comfortable. (laughs) Looks like there's a lot of this going on here, yes. (laughs) Peace to you all and all of you joining us online as well. Good morning. I invite you into our prayer of confession, which you'll find in your bulletin. Let's pray together. Holy God, we confess that we have not always been inclusive, even though we try to be that when we have observed difference, we have failed to marvel at the way that each person we meet is created in your image. We admit that we have much to learn when it comes to loving our neighbor as we love you and as we love ourselves. We are even skirting around the use of the word disability as we say this prayer. Because we we move toward full inclusion, it requires us to unlearn biases, including which words we should use. And this is uncomfortable work, God. Help us to value one another's humanity over our own discomfort over and over and over again. Amen. And God, we trust in you, we trust uh, in our own vulnerability that we come to you uh, to learn and unlearn as this prayer says. Guide us through this worship service that we may make it so in our hearts, minds, bodies, and ourselves as your eternal echo. Amen.
Thank you, thank you. I also just have to say, uh, it's my first time here being in the sanctuary uh, and with all of you, and I just also love this. <laughs> and I love the sounds. Talk about the voice of God and how close you all are. Um, these lovely echoes as I was sitting in between these sounds. <laughs> it's been so lovely. So our gospel reading for today comes from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, uh, verses 25 through 34. Let us hear God's word. Now, there was a woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years. After a long and painful treatment from various doctor, doctors, she had spent all she had without getting better. In fact, she was getting worse. She had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him in a crowd and touched his cloak. If I can touch even the hem, she told herself, I will be well again. Immediately, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately aware that healing power had gone out of him, Jesus turned to the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples said, You see how the crowd is pressing on you, and yet you say, Who touched me? But Jesus continued to look around and see who had done it. Then the woman came forward, frightened and trembling because she knew what had happened to her, and she fell at Jesus' feet and told him the whole truth. My daughter, Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be free of your affliction. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So blessed Access Sunday to you all, dear kin in Christ. Our scripture today reminds us of what it means to be embodied, to have a body which is denied access, others which are granted it, to have God in a body, to be restored to the communal body and called daughter, to be called family once again. It reminds us today how what body you are in still comes with different levels of access care, and concern. Whether you are in a black body, a queer body, a refugee body, a child's body, a woman's body, a trans or gender expansive body, a disabled body, a chronically ill body, a birthing body, or even a dying body. We started this service feeling our heartbeat, our breath, our collective hearts beating and breathing together. We wouldn't be here without our bodies, at least in this sense. Our bodies remind us of the polar opposites of life and all the spectrum that exists in between them for simply being here, simply existing. On the one hand, on the one end, you have pleasure, laughter, joy, satisfaction, rest, 
relaxation, skin to skin bonding, your mom picking you, scooping you up and carrying you outside. <laughs> All of this, which is crucial for our survival. It's as crucial, this bonding, this skin to skin bonding is as crucial for our survival when we're babies as food. And then on the other hand, on the other end of this uh, trial here of being alive, we have pain, we have illness, we have a landing place for oppression, heartbreak, tears, death. Our bodies are where all of this life happens. So to enter more deeply our scripture passage and this broader conversation about disability justice this morning, I offer the on-ramp of just remembering that we're all in bodies, no matter how those bodies are. The title of my sermon is called Tincture, named after the poem by queer poet who is currently battling cancer, Andrea Gibson. So allow me to recite some of their words back to you about being in a body. They write, imagine, when a human dies, the soul misses the body actually grieves the loss of its hands and all they could hold. The soul misses how the mind told the body, you have fallen from grace. And the body said, erase every scripture that doesn't have a pulse. There isn't a single page in the Bible that can wince, that can clumsy, that can freckle, that can hunger. The soul misses what the body could not let go. What else could hold on so tightly to everything? What else could hear the chain of a swing set and fall to its knees? What else could touch a screen door and taste lemonade? What else could come back from a war and not come back, but still try to live, still try to lullaby? When a human dies, the soul moves through the universe trying to describe how a body trembles when it's lost, softens when it's safe, how a wound would heal given nothing but time. Do you understand? Nothing in space can imagine it. No comet, no nebula, no ray of light can fathom the landscape of awe, the heat of shame. The fingertips pulling the first gray ha hair out and throwing it away. I can't imagine it, the stars say. Tell us again about goosebumps. Tell us again about pain. Tell us again about goosebumps. Tell us again about pain. The hemorrhaging woman, as she is often called, has something to say to the stars about both of these things. Yes, we have something to say about them too, amen. Like so many who received healing by Jesus, we don't actually get her name, but we do know a few things about her. We know that she has been suffering for 12 years. Twelve years. Twelve years is a long time in first century Palestine. It's a long time today. It's also a sacred number in the Bible, which can mean perfection or authority, which is just something interesting to note here. From historians, we know that being labeled impure due to her hemorrhages during this time wasn't just a given. It was actually a legal category that came with very different rights of access and relationships. We know that she had spent all that she had, which makes me wonder if she had been from a wealthier class at one point and then was ousted by her impure status. We don't really know how old she is, though often in art she's portrayed as this bent over, older, hemorrhaging woman, uh, presumably because her hemorrhaging lasted for so long. But I wonder if she was like me, and the millions of other people with uteruses who have endometriosis and fibroids and other serious conditions. It took me 10 years to get a diagnosis and I was only 23. And even after multiple surgeries and organ removal and a litany of other treatments, it continues to leave me in a state of chronic and continuous illness in spite of all that I've spent. I wonder if this woman had ever gotten to be married or had children, if she ever wanted that kind of life. From Mark's very specific language telling us that she, she had spent all that she had, not all of her family, not her husband, not all of they had, I wonder how lonely she was. Not just isolated, but lonely too. There was no one else with her. 
We know that she crossed several serious societal boundaries to go up to Jesus in a crowd in the middle of town, nonetheless, to receive her blessing. We know that she had heard about Jesus, but not how she heard about him or what she heard exactly. And so this part of my, my reflection with y'all is merely speculation, my own midrash, so bear with me. The preceding chapters of this story include the beginning of Jesus's first journey, what the scholars call that, out into the world in Mark's gospel. Our scripture today is included in that designation of this first journey. Prior to this story, Jesus is the one crossing boundaries all over the place, from Jewish territory to Gentile territory, which challenged hierarchical status quo to be sure, to crossing a physical boundary from land to sea, where he calms the storm on the ship, remember, with his frightened disciples, which is a power understood only to come from God. And at the very beginning of Mark 5, this particular chapter that we're in, right before this story happens, Jesus heals the man possessed by a legion of demons who lives in the cemetery or the tombs, as he's called. As you might recall from that story, per the demon's request, Jesus casts out those demons into a herd of pigs, and then the pigs jump off a cliff and drown, which is a pretty striking scene. As the story tells us, though, those weren't just some random wild pigs. Mark's gospel writer points out that they were the swine herd's property. And when the swine herds find out that the demoniac was healed and that Jesus healed them by putting the demons in their pigs, quote, then the crowd began to implore Jesus to leave their district, end quote. That's got to be a coincidence, I'm sure. Perhaps if Jesus did one of his lower cost healings, he would have been invited to stay. I can imagine the crowd saying, whoa, 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 can't you just, you know, rub some dirt and spit and, you know, wave your hands in that special way? Isn't that that thing you do? What's the deductible on her insurance plan? Are you in a network provider covered by her HMO or PPO? Moreover, why are we getting involved in this mess? What does this person have to do with us? We're just hanging out in our town, minding our own business. Isn't it interesting that while Jesus could easily cast out a whole legion of demons all by him, his own good self, a pretty useful skill in that time, the crowd rejects him anyway. The possessed man whom Rita Nakashima Brock notes was likely a war veteran under Roman occupation, given that legion was the term used by the military. This poor known was known as a problem in their town, but they didn't like getting involved in the solution did they? They wanted to ask, what's wrong with this man? And stop there, not, what's wrong with us that he has nowhere else to go but live in the cemetery? Or how did we get here? Or the question of activist Ruby Sales asking him, where does it hurt? What happened to you? This is what is called the social or con cultural construct of disability. It's not my physical or mental impairment or difference or illness that's the problem. It's the inaccessible society and relationships that causes the real suffering. So, I imagine Jesus healing the demoniac and then getting kicked out of town. And then I imagine this story, this particular story, reaching the hemorrhaging woman's ears. I imagine her hearing about this Jesus not only as a profound healer, but as a fellow outcast. Leave, they told Jesus. We don't want you here, even if you can do such miraculous things. Perhaps just as important, I imagine her not only feeling seen by Jesus, but Jesus perhaps feels seen by her. Oh, I know what that's like, Jesus. I too have been told to leave, to live just on the outskirts of town, and I see you making a way out of no way anyway. Like the poem earlier, tell me about goosebumps. Would you tell me about your pain? The account also says that she doesn't even touch his body, rather just the hem of his cloak. As many scholars know, this was most likely his prayer shawl as a practicing Jewish woman, Jewish man at the time. 
She reaches him in that place of longing, that place from isolation and silence, things that Jesus knows all too well. Remember, we're in Mark's gospel, and in Mark's gospel, we don't get the Christmas story. There's no manger scene with angels or magi for Mark's Jesus. Instead, we start with 40 days in the desert and temptations by the devil. Mark's Jesus knows torment and loneliness. Mark's Jesus knows the broken systems of the world that he was made flesh into and has to reckon with. He knows. He understands. And another rarity for scripture, this story brings us into the mind, dare I say, the prayer of the hemorrhaging woman. How often does that happen? (laughs) If I can touch even the hem, she had told herself, I will be well again. Also, I notice that it is not if he touches me, I will be healed. Rather, if I can touch even the hem. She flips things on their head yet again here and has agency. She has agency with Jesus. And even though she is afraid that she did something wrong when Jesus reacts with, who touched me? He wasn't mad at all, was he? In fact, he leans in more deeply Scripture tells us that she told him the whole truth. She gets to share her story. And unlike the disciples who would get interrupted by Jesus all the time because they're just yammering on about unimportant things, we can assume that Jesus simply listens to her since she is able to tell the whole of it. Therein lies another extraordinary healing, to be heard after all of those years. Unlike other healing stories where the townsfolk demand an explanation or proof that Jesus healed them, that's not why she tells her story. She's not defending or explaining anything. She's responding to the question, who, who touched me? And she gets to say who she is and is finally understood. Then from this place, she is called daughter, a term of family, not just woman or hey you, and is brought back into the community, no further questions asked. However, disability theologian Callie McHale poses this question to us. What if we saw disability as the site of divine revelation about God's kingdom and about our place in it, as an expression of power and wisdom and agency rather than merely a source of suffering or lack or ignorance? What if this was revealed for Jesus in real time too, about what God's kingdom really means, who it is for, where it belongs. In the story of the hemorrhaging woman, we get a story for our times about disability justice. There is no romanticized version of her suffering and illness, something to find some twisted glory in. There is no infantilizing of her, demeaning her. There is no accusation that her suffering is somehow caused because she didn't try hard enough or pray hard enough or believe hard enough or that she has some lesson she has to learn. There is no objectification of her as a sign of God's power through Jesus. There is no using her as a mere plot device, just there to help us understand some other characters better. No. She's a person in her own right, a woman who had had enough knew her worth and agency, bucked the social conventions that did not care about her, and told her story. How might we receive her story this morning? What I'm left taking in from this story yet again is how God's work is at the margins, and it is those most at the margins who must lead the way. By her actions, the hemorrhaging woman communicated something profound about who and what we regard as disposable and how what she needed is, in fact, what we all need. For me, this idea is best articulated by Aurora Levine's Morales, a disability justice activist and a queer Jewish Puerto Rican poet. So let me leave you with her words as we think about this concept more broadly. What our bodies require in order to to thrive is what the world requires. If there is a map to get there, it can be found in the atlas on our skin and bone and blood, in the tracks of our neurotransmitters and antibodies. 
When I write about cancer and exhaustion and irritable bowels in the context of a treeless slopes of my homeland, of market-driven famine and the possible extinction of bees, I'm tracing that map with my fingertips, walking into the heart of the storm that shakes my body and the shake that occupies the world. When I can hold the truth of my flesh as one protesting voice in a multitude, a witness, an opponent to what greed has wrought, awareness becomes bearable, and I rejoice in the clarity that illness has given me. I rejoice in this clarity. May this clarity, may this tincture, may this story of the hemorrhaging woman told, retold here again, bless us all this morning and our lives however they are. Amen. Hymn number 179. Let us receive your healing grace, O oh God. And as we all acknowledge our yearn for wholeness, let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us in whatever language is most comfortable to have a moment of unity together as we say the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have a call for offering, which I see somebody coming back there to come and offer your gifts of time, presence, uh, resources into the plate there.
invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we offer these gifts up to God and sing our doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings fall. Praise Christ all creatures here below. Praise Holy Spirit of the dead. One God Let us continue to pray the prayer of gratitude together found in your bulletins. Holy, Holy One, One, you are the source of all that we are and all that we have. While you are most desired than gold and sweeter than honey, we bring you these gifts that they may be used to revive souls and meet the needs of those in this faith community and in the wider world. Bless these gifts and this community of faith that we may be instruments of your peace and ambassadors of your love, so that all those we meet may know that you are accessible to them and present for them. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of your wonderful faces this morning. I'm going to share some announcements this morning. Uh, each week, Pastor Brooke begins announcements by framing them in um, the way of our mission statement. And it was brought to her attention that maybe not everybody looks up as they exit the sanctuary every week to read the banner that displays it. So uh, through the end of this year, when we share the announcements, we are going to begin them by saying our mission statement. Called by God through the Holy Spirit, we provide a safe place to belong where all are welcome. Following the example of Jesus, we minister to those in need, living out our faith in the wider community and inviting everyone to the table. As a way to spread the good news of God's infinite love for all, our, uh, our service will be available this week on our Facebook page and YouTube channel beginning tomorrow. We live out our mission to minister to those in need by bringing in peanut butter for our monthly in-gathering. This week, I tried to count how many pounds we did have because we have the goal of making 75, and I think we had close to 40. So we have a couple more weeks to collect peanut butter, and I hope you will uh, bring some jars in over the next couple of weeks. You may contribute financially to the Neighbors in Need Fund, which is part of our contribution uh, to our church's uh, wider, uh, our wider church. A Bible study will meet this week on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Thank you to all who attended the concert this week and all who helped out uh, serving meals, ushering for the Cornerstone Chorale. Um, it was a wonderful evening of shared music together. Um, if you were here, you definitely know how wonderful that time was. Uh, this morning, we welcome to the pulpit uh, Reverend Dr. Elise Berry as our guest preacher. She serves as the Associate for Advocacy and Leadership Development for the Council of Health and Human Services Ministries of the United Church of Christ. Um, you know in the UCC we love our acronyms, uh, so often that is referred to as CHISM. Prior to this role, she was at the uh, Postdoctoral Fellow in Bioethics at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and she's a board-certified hospital chaplain uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, she was. Elise and her husband, Reverend Mark Berry, are elders in their home congregation, the Disciples Christian Church, and they live in Cleveland Heights with their two rambunctious children and sweet cats. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one with a rambunctious child. <laughs> Tonight is our second um, messy church here from 4 to 6 p.m. We are excited to 
uh, foster an attitude of gratitude with the theme of thanksgiving. Uh, we will meet here, we'll have activities to begin, and then we will break out for more activities. Uh, we will end our time together with a short service of worship and then a meal together, which will be a baked potato bar. So please come, bring friends and family and neighbors. I hope to see you all here this evening for a fun time at Messy Church. There is also a sign-up sheet out in the gathering room on the bulletin board for the Thursday night gathering um, for dinner on October 26th at 5.30 p.m. This month, is going to, it's going to be at Burntwood Tavern in Rocky River, um, and I just wanted to let you know that because I'm not sure if we shared that, um, and there's no one currently signed up, so if you would like to attend that gathering, um, please sign up on the board so that Jennifer can call Burntwood Tavern and let them know um, how many people to expect. We invite everyone to the table during our fellowship time. We are still in need of people to sign up um, to host fellowship time. And if you would like to be part of that ministry, you can sign up in the bulletin board in the hallway outside the office. Uh, you have been generous in ministering to those in need within our own congregation by preparing just a little extra and placing one serving in a microwave safe container and labeling what it is and a date so that Nurse Nancy can deliver it to those um, who need meals, uh, including Bob Patswell, John Michalik, um, and Emma Kozar as well. Uh, finally, uh, providing a safe place to belong at Church of the Redeemer includes caring for yourself to protect others. The latest COVID shots, flu shots, and RSV shots are now available, um, and we urge you to get those as uh, your doctor suggests for you. God's infinite love is spread through our prayers. You may place your prayer requests in the basket on the table in the gathering room for people or situations that have long-term needs. And finally, please rise in body or spirit to sing our final hymn together, number 284, Joys Are Flowing Like a River. Oh. 
what assurance in my soul. On the stormy sea, Jesus speaks to me, and the bellows cease to roll. May we go from this place with this kind of assurance. May whatever stormy seas we're navigating be blessed by God, who can help us navigate it. So go forth, knowing that our God is accessible within us and all around us, and that we have the power to make an accessible world for all. Amen.